I am Dr. Peter Melanowski, clinical psychologist, passionate Catholic. I am the host of this podcast, Interior Integration for Catholics. And Interior Integration for Catholics is part of our broader outreach at Souls and Hearts. Uh, that's where we have the best of psychological resources, the human formation resources, all grounded in the Catholic faith at soulsandhearts.com. And here we are. It is so good to be with you in episode 106 of Interior Integration for Catholics. This episode is titled, God in the Hands of Angry Sinners. God in the Hands of Angry Sinners. We were recording this live on February 18th, 2023, and we will release it to all the major podcast platforms on Monday, February 20th. So as most of you know, we are weaving in an extra podcast each month. And the first Monday of the month, that'll always still be for our conceptual, our analytical podcast. That's where we lay out in a more of a lecture style, a long form solo cast, where I talk about something really of importance. We've been on this theme of anger. But then the one that we release on the third Monday of the month, that one is always an experiential exercise where we can come together because it's not just enough to nourish our minds. It's not just enough to understand things intellectually. It's not enough to just stay in our heads. We need to get to the heart. We need to get to our bones. And the way that we can do that is through experience, not just studying this stuff. That's important. It's important to have an intellectual foundation, but we want to get to the level of the heart. That's what these experiential exercises are for. And so we're going to do another one today, like we did in episode 100, like we did in 102, like we did in 104. And today we are going to be looking at our anger inside at God. We're going to begin to approach the anger within us that we probably don't even know we have. We want to do this, though, in a way that's really safe. Safety is really important. I'll talk about that in just a bit. And we want to do this in a way that's very loving toward ourselves. Our Lord told us, love your neighbor as yourself. We are supposed to love ourselves. We want to work with our parts who are afraid of our anger. We want to work with our parts that are holding our anger. We want to do it in the right order. And so I will help you kind of walk through that. These experiential exercises, they're here to help you connect with what's going on inside you, with your own internal experience, and especially to help you connect with your parts, the parts that are holding you back in some way from a more deep and rich and full relationship with the three persons of the Trinity and with Mary, our mother. Now, when we start talking about parts. We're talking about these like little sub-personalities within us. Each of us have these parts, unique constellations of needs and emotions and body sensations and guiding beliefs and assumptions. These typical thoughts, intentions, desires, attitudes, impulses, body sensations. These are our parts, like little, little persons within us. And if it's helpful, you can think of these parts as modes of operating. These parts or modes of operating exist even when we're not aware of them, even when they're not in our conscious awareness. And as we get into this topic of our anger at God, and in particular, our hidden anger at God, this can be difficult material, really difficult material. It can bring up a lot of intensity, a lot of emotion, a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear that our protector parts have about our anger at God, which is one of the reasons why that anger is so often in our unconscious. Stakes are really high, too, when we're dealing with anger at God. Some parts are so afraid of God's reaction to our anger. So if you notice that during this experiential exercise that you are exiting your window of tolerance to the upside, you're revving up, you're, you're moving into fight or flight mode, getting really anxious, or there's so much emotional intensity, I'm going to invite you to, to slow it down. You don't have to stay with the experiential exercise. You're free to reground yourself. And if you notice that you're dropping into a freeze response, a dorsal vagal response where you're shutting down, numbing out disconnecting, right? We want to pay attention to that too. We can work with our internal experience so much more effectively if we are within our window of tolerance where things are bearable. 
where we're not moving out of a mode of connecting and into a, a mode of protecting. So in order to foster that, in order to foster that safety, I want you to know that you can go at your own pace. And that's going to vary from person to person. So I'm really paying attention to what your internal system can handle. We don't want to rush it. We don't want to charge forward. We want to do good preparatory work. We are going to be connecting first with your manager parts. These are the parts, you're, and, and, specifically, and specifically with your spiritual manager parts. These are the parts of you that handle a lot of your spiritual life, handle your relationship with God ordinarily. And we're going to work in a way that really respects them because they are so invested in trying to keep you safe. And we don't want to do things in an experiential exercise like this that that don't feel safe to those parts because that's a matter of respect. We want to work in a way that's really collaborative and really cooperative, not in a way that's really polarized. We're not trying to resolve all of your anger at God today. We're not trying to process unmetabolized trauma. We're not doing any therapy today. Uh, we don't do that in these podcasts. We don't do that in Souls and Hearts. But there's an invitation for you to find out so much more about how your system reacts to anger at God, right? So take what's useful to you. If you're going in a direction that seems really helpful and really fruitful, you're welcome to, to continue with that. I'm not asking you to necessarily follow what I'm offering you if there's something much more fruitful that you're doing in your own work. It's helpful to have pens and pencils to write things down if that's helpful, like a journal. You can map out things. Uh, you can draw if that's helpful. And you're also welcome to be really physically comfortable. I can invite you to be able to move around. You can close your eyes. If you're listening to this in a recording, you can pause the recording in order to be able to spend more time in uh, your work with your parts, whenever that would be helpful. A lot of freedom here for parts to be able to work together under the leadership of your innermost self, under the guidance of your innermost self. So as we begin, just some reminders from the last episode, episode 105. These are the reasons I offered in that episode to work through your anger at God. And the first is that God asks us, he commands us to love him with our whole heart. All parts of us is the way I interpret that. He says, love the Lord your God with your whole heart. Not with some of your heart, not with some of your parts, not just with your spiritual managers, but with your whole heart, all of your being, every fiber of your being. And when we work through our anger at God, that can bring us into a much deeper and more loving relationship with him. God has shown us how to bring our anger to him in the scriptures, particularly in the Psalms, but in so many other examples of scripture, I go through a bunch of those in episode 105, he wants us to bring his anger to him. He's a, our loving father. He wants us as his beloved sons and daughters to bring us the anger so that he can help us work through that. Third is that God can make great good come from your anger at him, deepening the realness in your relationship with him and becoming closer as you work through that conflict or that tension. The fourth is that you're much more likely to sin if you banish your anger at God into your unconscious. If you won't tolerate the parts of you that carry anger at God, those parts are much more likely to create these impulses that can lead us to act out in negative ways, to enact the anger in some behavioral way. The fifth is that your anger at God can be fuel for your agency. It can give you the fuel that can supercharge your capacity to do good. If we can convert that and we can direct that in a way that's healthy, that's life-giving, that's a huge gift. And then the last one is that trying to hide your anger from God doesn't work anyway. It's not like you're able to really keep it from his awareness because he's omniscient. It just leaves you less able to engage your will and your intellect to engage your reason in a way that is going to be really much more productive, much better, much more adaptive, much more holy. So those are some reasons that I just wanted to offer. I wanted to review real quickly for your managers around being able to do this work. 
And so now we're going to begin the exercise proper. And I say this next part a lot, a lot of gentleness with yourself. I'm just going to invite parts of you that have been really critical of you to see if they can soften and relax back during this exercise to see if we can have a little more space for you as your innermost self to lead and guide your system. We're going to slow things down. We're going to work in a way that's collaborative and cooperative with your parts. That's really important. We don't want to steamroll parts that have concerns about your anger at God. Working with care and compassion and starting with those parts that we're aware of right now, the parts of us that are heavily involved in our spiritual lives. We're going to attend to those protectors. We're going to attend to those spiritual managers first. And if we don't get permission from those protectors, from our spiritual managers, those that protect us, then we don't move forward with pursuing the anger at God deeper within us because we need to have those parts on board first. They are really important and we don't want to set up polarizations among parts. We want to make sure that we're really addressing their concerns, not blowing them off, not brushing them aside. If we're doing that, that means we're blended with another part of us that has an agenda to get to the anger. And it may not be time yet. That anger is unconscious for a reason. And the reason is usually that it doesn't feel safe enough yet. So this idea of safety is so important. So I'm just going to invite you, if you've done parts work before, you may know who your spiritual managers are. Uh, but I'm going to invite you to just connect with the parts of yourself that help you with the spiritual life, that try to motivate you to pray, that try to get you to, to do the kinds of things that you do in your spiritual life, spiritual reading, meditation, going to confession, going to mass. And I'm just going to invite you to connect with them about this topic of anger at God. Those parts might not feel a lot of anger toward God. Maybe they do, but often they don't. That's not uncommon. And I'm curious about what those parts of you want you to know about anger at God. How do they see it? How do they evaluate anger at God? Is it okay to be angry at God? What concerns would those parts have if you did feel anger at God? If anger at God did come bubbling up, what might their concerns be? What would that mean?
And this might just be a hypothetical question, but like, if you did feel angry toward God, what do these spiritual manager parts, what do they think would happen if you started to feel angry at God, if you felt that emotion of anger? And so they have these positions about anger at God and whether it's okay and what would happen if you did feel anger toward God, maybe a lot of anger toward God. How did they learn that? How did they come to believe what they believe about anger at God? What's the story about how they learned that? What are the memories or the experiences, the people that taught them something about whether it's safe to be angry at God or not safe? And how did they make sense of those experiences? What did they come to conclude about God and God's reaction to anger? And can it be okay just to hear the story without judging it or without submitting it to, you know, some sort of heresy test? Can we just hear what these parts are telling us? Can parts that are worried just understand that we're just listening? We're not necessarily endorsing everything that our managers might be saying. But these are beliefs that are within us. They're held by parts. Can we hear them out just because we care about the parts? Is that okay for your innermost self to have the space to hear the story?
to go back to the key moments that these beliefs were formed in. Any part that's not in right relationship with your innermost self is going to be confused about God, is going to have misunderstandings of God, is going to hold negative beliefs about God, heretical beliefs about God. It's so common. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, God tells us in Isaiah 55. Neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts from your thoughts. He knows that we don't understand. He knows that we're little, that we get confused, that we have limited vision. And that leads me to another question for your spiritual managers. Have your spiritual managers ever checked out these beliefs with God? Or have they always been just assumptions? kind of unquestioned assumptions, what Christopher Bolas calls unthought knowns, things that these parts know in quotation marks, but they've never thought about, never examined. Could it be okay? Could we take a little risk here? Could we seek to understand this more deeply? Would that be okay? In working with anger at God, we're going to ask that the parts who do have anger at God, that they not overwhelm us. If we're going to work with those parts, and I'm not saying we are, okay, but if you do work with those parts, we're going to ask those parts not to overwhelm you with anger at God, not to flood you with the intensity of that anger toward God. It's a safety thing. It's really, really important. If there are parts that are burdened with anger at God, and if you do work with them at some point, that they, that they not overwhelm you because of the safety. If your managers, if your spiritual managers are willing to open up your system, are willing to allow your innermost self to come into connection with parts that carry intense anger toward God, those parts that carry intense anger toward God, they can limit how much they blend, how much they share of that anger. And that's so helpful in working collaboratively and cooperatively. Sometimes it's best just to let 1% or 2% of the anger be experienced so that we can stay in that window of tolerance so that your innermost self can continue to lead and guide your system so that your spiritual managers don't freak out 
and reclaim control and go back to that really conflict driven polarization way of working got an opportunity to do it so much differently for you as the innermost self with the grace to love all of your parts no part left behind all of your parts are good all made by God and he saw that they were very good parts are not their burdens parts are not their anger parts are not their beliefs those are, can be burdens the parts carry often are burdens that can be let go And I'm just going to invite your managers to consider a situation. I'm not saying this is your experience. I'm just making something up. But if a little part of you prayed and prayed and prayed that your dog who was sick wouldn't die, and that part prayed and prayed, knew that God could heal, knew that, the, that God could raise from the dead, had heard that at Mass, had heard that in in, uh, in preschool, you know, that little part of you prayed and prayed, but your dog died anyway. How might that little part feel toward God? What if that's all that little part of you knew of God? Can you imagine what that little part might think of God? Could that little part love God from that position? Especially if that little part's been banished because of its anger or grief or disappointment in God. We all have things like that within us. Ways we misunderstand, ways we have a very narrow vision of the world, very childlike, young ways of understanding. It doesn't mean that a part who prayed and prayed for her dog to live and the dog died, doesn't mean that that part's bad. It means that that part's alone with a burden. There are always reasons why parts are angry at God. There's always reasons. And if God were like how those parts thought he was, it makes sense to be angry at a God like that. That's a little idol. A misunderstanding, a misrepresentation of God, a distorted God image. And when we can connect with our parts that carry those God images, we can free ourselves from those idols by God's grace. It also sets us up to be able to experience God as he actually is, not as our parts have misunderstood him. He's not going to invade, though. He's not going to intrude upon you. The question is, will we give him some space? And I'm not even asking you to do that now. It may be way too soon. What I'm asking is, is your innermost self able to be with your parts? Would it be okay for your innermost self to love your parts? Parts that are angry at God.
Would it be okay to hear how parts have felt unheard, ignored by God, betrayed by God, how they felt harmed by God, how they felt abandoned by God? These are the things that bring up the anger at God. These perceptions, these misunderstandings, these ways of construing their experience. That's what brings up the anger at God. And that can be healed if parts can connect with your faith and if they can taste and see how God really is. But you know what, spiritual managers? You get to have a huge say in whether that happens or not. Because I don't doubt in the power of spiritual managers to really be gatekeepers along these lines. What would, it, what would it be like if you knew that these parts could be healed? By love. By the love from yourself. And then when it felt okay, when it felt safe enough to come into contact with the living God as he actually is. This can take time. We don't want to rush slow as fast in working with these questions around God and who God is and who we are and what anger means. I'm grateful for the space you had to work with these questions of anger at God to consider new things grateful to your protectors for the ways they've tried to help you and keep you safe. Thankful for the willingness to engage in this kinds of exercise. I'm going to invite your spiritual managers to see if they felt like they were respected and treated with dignity in this exercise. They have a sense of being loved by you. They have a sense of being understood, cared about. There's a way to work with this that's good for all your parts. And I'm going to invite you as we wind up for you to write down things you've learned, to put into writing part things that parts want you to know, the big takeaways, the big insights in a parts journal. Many parts like to really have their uh, voices recorded. Somehow seems to make it more real. You're welcome to do this exercise again uh, when the recording comes out to, to, uh, with different parts, if that's helpful to you. And this doesn't have to be the end of connecting with your parts about anger with God. I hope it's just another point in the journey. So with that, I'm going to invite you to just take the time you need to connect with parts. If there's something that a part would like you to share with the group. We're going to be opening this up for people to share their experiences, uh, to debrief, to ask questions. Really invite folks, if, they, if they're if they open to it, to, to putting their hand up, you know, either their physical hand on the Zoom camera or their um, electronic hand, uh, if they'd like to be 
uh, able to share that out loud, that would be great. Really like that interpersonal connection. Or to put things in the chat. If you have something that you'd like to share in the chat, I'll be monitoring that. We want to make sure that we don't steamroll any parts when we share. Something that a part feels like is too exposing. We want you to be really thoughtful. If there's, if there's doubt about that, if there's questions about that, I invite you to not share it, actually. We want to be really respectful of our parts. Our next live experience of the IIC podcast will be on Wednesday, March 15th, 2023, from 7 o'clock p.m. to 8 o'clock p.m. That's in the evening, Eastern Time. We'll be doing another live experiential exercise. So March 15th, 2023, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to be getting a link out in our Wednesday email reflection. We're also going to be uh, posting that on our website, our landing page for this podcast, which is soulsandhearts.com backslash IIC. You can register to join us again in the Zoom. I invite you to check out the Resilient Catholics community. That is the community where I put so much energy. We have more than 100 experiential exercises like this. We have a structured program to help people overcome the human formation obstacles to deeply connecting with God, our Father, and with Mary, our Mother. The human formation work that needs to be done. You can check that out, the Resilient Catholics community. The Interior Therapist community is also going to be opening up new groups. I'm actually going to be leading some foundations experiential groups for Catholic therapists and graduate students in mental health fields. Those will be starting in April. You can check out all about that at soulsandhearts.com backslash ITC. And uh, you can meet me in person in San Diego. I'm going to be in San Diego from April 20th to 22nd at the Catholic Psychotherapy Association Conference. I'll be presenting a paper with Jody Garneau, who is the lead navigator of the ITC. You can check that out at the CPA website at catholicpsychotherapy.org. And uh, there'll also be some more details about that in our weekly reflections. If you're not getting those, I invite you to subscribe to those. Go to soulsandhearts.com, click on the button that says get Dr. Peter's weekly email reflection. Also, You can always reach out to me. My email is crisis at soulsandhearts.com. My phone number, my cell number is 317-567-9594. And I sit by my phone every Tuesday and Thursday from 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time to 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time and just take calls from folks that are listeners to this podcast that read the weekly reflections that would like to just engage about something. Again, no therapy there. I'm not doing consultations, but I we do have conversations and those are private, just you and me on the phone about anything that um, came up about these podcasts and about the weekly reflections. And so with that, just going to invite folks to anybody that would like to connect around the questions that they had, about the experience that they had, anything that parts would like to share, and we'll we'll see where, where, where that takes us. So we have a question here. Where can I find the agenda for the CPA conference? Therapist is interested in it, but can't find it. It's probably not been posted yet. I happen to know that I'm presenting on that Friday from 1.30 to 3 and from 3.30 to 5, but that's because it was in my contract. I don't think that they've actually put out the schedule yet. So... The other thing about the CPA conference is that it's going to be live streamed. Um, So if you can't go to to San Diego in person, you can live stream it. And that's of interest, I think, to lots of people who are not therapists. Yes, Adele. Um, I was noticing that if I acknowledged anger at God, one of my parts, that the, um, I guess the result would be ingratitude. Mm. If there was anger then that would result in being ungrateful. Yeah, from some of my part. So that's uh, that's what I connected with today. And it sounds like for one of your parts, it's really important that you be grateful toward God. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. really important. Yeah. And does that make sense to you that a part really wants you to be grateful toward God? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's an amazing thing because we have this multiplicity, because we have these parts, we can simultaneously experience all kinds of things that might seem at first blush to be contradictory, (laughs) you know? Yeah, totally makes sense to me. And, you know, is it possible, and you don't have to answer this, but is it possible that 
that parts could believe that you could be both at the same time? Or does that just not seem like it's possible? On first asking, that seems impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. On first asking, because this is where we're starting to get in touch with. I love the way you were able to bring that up spontaneously, because that's often where our parts are. At, that's their default assumption. Mm -hmm. They don't know otherwise. But actually, in relationships that are intimate, in relationships that are close, the more uh, complexity there can be the more engagement we have with parts. And so it is entirely possible. And I think it's actually for Catholics that are serious about the faith, the norm, even though we don't know it, that we can both be grateful and be angry at the same time. Right. Hmm. Dr. Peter? Yes, yes, Madeline. Um, so first of all, this this was helpful to me because I'd never thought about spiritual managers. <laughs> so um, I'm very, I'm very much in aware of, of anger, parts that carry anger to God, but this was helpful because I could see where the polarizations are, which I wouldn't have known otherwise. My question is once like I I've got in touch with my anger. And so and so now I've been trying to work with it and, and, and not work with the angry parts because they're too upset. Right, right, right. But to kind of um, deal with it intellectually, which I haven't been doing, mm -hmm. sort of say, like to uh, acknowledge that God is good, that he doesn't will bad things for us. Mm -hmm. so, to, so to kind of bring that dialectic into more, focus to myself and deal with it at least intellectually to begin with mm -hmm. so in the process of doing that do you think it can affect any of the parts either the parts that hold anger or the protectors can it affect them to to kind of soften them or does it can it shift the system a little bit just having an intellectual understanding of mm -hmm. what's going on you know, that's such a great question, Madeline. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. In a system, if any single part of a system, any single element of a system or a part, as we're talking about in these systems, is moved or changed by something, by whatever it is, that affects the whole system. So what I see as really valuable about episode 105 for example where we get into the conceptual you know ideas about anger at god is that it can help our spiritual manager parts to see that there's a legitimate rationale for taking some risks you know for saying okay i'm going to challenge my assumption that there can't be gratitude and anger at the same time you know for example going back to to what you shared before adele um but yeah, and then what I think is most helpful, where this gets more integrated is if parts can experience being loved, being loved in whatever place they happen to be. Uh, because all love ultimately comes from God. So if you as your innermost self is loving your part, that love is coming from God, even if that part doesn't know it, even if it's not being specified that way. What really changes parts, positions toward God is two things. One, connecting with your faith, right? That infused virtue, knowing of things that are unseen. And then the second thing is tasting and seeing who God really is. Because ultimately who really changes the God images is God himself. When parts are able to, under the guidance of the self, under the care of the self, the self is the mediator, come to see God as he actually is through the lived experience of him tasting and seeing. So faith and then tasting and seeing. Is that helpful? But there's yeah. a, it takes a while to get there, right? I yeah. mean, sometimes our managers are like, well, we've got to have it all at once. We're going to do this instantaneously. There's no process allowed in that that's just really violent on some of our parts uh, to, to be treated that way. So thank you. 
Well, thank you for sharing that with us. So good to have you. Okay, great. Yes, Lisa. Uh, well, it was an interesting experiential exercise. I, I've kept the idea of Job, the book of Job kept mm -hmm. coming up and I kept wondering, did he really exhibit any anger toward God? And I don't know it that well, apparently, but I think he was, I think he was upset. I don't know if he really showed anger, but um, I don't have any trouble uh, looking at the anger that I have toward God. Um, however, at the end, I think to myself, so what? <laughs> so we have all this anger, <laughs> but God will continue to be God and allow things to happen through his permissive will that don't coincide with what I want or what I pray for. And so I kind of concluded that even though I don't understand God fully and I, I believe in his love, but I believe his love is dangerous because yeah, yeah. he can permit so many bad things yeah. you know, to happen. Yeah. So it's kind of like, I feel like the kinds of things that I pray for, and I noticed this when I went to the Blessed Sacrament yesterday, that lately my prayer has has been, please, God, protect this person, and, and kind of like that dog, <laughs> that dog and chinchin you were talking about, <laughs> please protect this person, please help that person. And I felt like I was really resorting to this vending machine kind of God. Right, right, right. And so I... I went to the Blessed Sacrament and I said, you know, God, Jesus, I know you're here, Jesus. All I really want is to be close to you because this is a dangerous world and a dangerous life. <laughs> and I just want to believe in your love no matter what happens. And I think part of that is hard because of my father image. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I really just like the idea of God transforming my image of him because mm -hmm. mine is just so limited kind of what I, what i got out of that whole thing well thank you thank you for that lisa episodes 23 to 29 of this podcast are all about those toxic god images and those are formed into us by our experiences of authority figures primarily parents but also teachers and coaches and priests and you know and for good or for or for bad so so glad that you can touch base with those and i do think job was really angry at god i mean when you look at verses or chapter 10 verse 3 he says to god does it seem good to thee to oppress to despise the work of thy hands and favor the designs of the wicked i mean that's that's those are accusations and i can't help but hear anger in that so so we're given these examples of, of, of being able to bring that anger to God and wrestle with it instead of burying it, hiding it, allowing it to fester and so forth. So, so thank you for that. Okay. So this is from Emily. She says, my experience is that I'm holding things which seem to not go together yet do so peacefully somehow within me. For example, a part of me believes that anger at God is pointless, potentially dangerous, and something I don't want to become a sin by becoming bitter, etc. At the same time, I also believe that being angry is important, permissible, part of being human in the history of God's people. God is big enough to handle our anger. And I believe it's important to bring anger to God in prayer because God understands our pain, sometimes or maybe often better than we do. He doesn't get angry at us for feeling angry. Anger is often pain, grief, fear, or other things going on. This is a really beautiful insight that, uh, that Emily is sharing with us about her own experience. And it contains a really critical truth. Anger is always a reaction. It's always a reaction to something else, to some perceived injustice, to some kind of unresolved grief, some kind of fear. Uh, that's that's a common for me in my system for anger to suppress fear. For a lot of people, fear suppresses anger. For me, anger suppresses fear. And so all of these things can be going on at the same time. And this is reason why integration is so important because if they all are just going on separately, it becomes chaotic and confusing inside. The more that we can connect, the more that these parts can be led and guided by our innermost self, 
the better that we're going to be able to see God and respond to him in love. You know, St. Thomas Aquinas talks about how internal integration of each of us is critical for our union with God. If we are fragmented, if we're fractured, we're not going to be able to engage in a relationship of union, of loving union with anybody, including God. So this work is really critical. So, so thank you for sharing that, Emily. And if there are additional responses, go ahead and put them in the chat. You know, um, yeah, I'll try to follow up with them. So, so this one, sharing my experience, my spiritual manager, my black belt Catholic, just love that black belt Catholic was saddened by the theme of anger at God and agreed to pray for parts angry at God, a part called jumper who wants to flee from the exercise, feeling guilty for taking time away from my family to be here, wanting to do something instead of being still. And another part seemed huddled in the dark, very small, perhaps damned or feeling beyond hope. But black belt Catholic part allowed me to let a little beam of light enter that dark cell to offer a glimpse of hope. Now, the imagery here is really powerful, right? It reminds me of Isaiah. And I think about it, I'm going to change the words a little bit to fit the context, but the parts that have dwelt in darkness have seen a great light on the parts that have walked in endless gloom, gloom a light has shown. This is what happens when our, when our managers can let a little bit of space in, a little bit of light in. It's not just the love of the self, but what animates the love from your innermost self towards your parts is love that comes from God. They begin to taste a little bit of who God is when you love you. And then uh, she goes on later in the exercise, a banner waving part, an accuser part that has brought up my sins and bad habits, planning confession and strict fast relent to atone for sin. Okay, so obviously, yeah, there's parts that want to try to save us, want to try to make up for it. This exercise sure brought out some active parts, and I plan to go back and listen again to be able to get to know these parts better and to learn to love them. Well, beautiful. There's an example of beautiful work. And whenever you do that work and you're connecting with your parts and you're learning to love yourself, it is a gift to all of us, to every single one of us. It's a gift to me personally, because we are together in the body of Christ. And when you are doing this kind of work, it builds up the entire body and helps me personally. So I have a lot of gratitude in my parts for that work being done. So another one, my spiritual manager part, who is also in exile, has an upside down view of God after remembering my trauma. This leaves my manager part feeling sick, sad, scared, fearing God, because my angry, my angry part is scared to show the anger toward God. Yeah, these parts are really phenomenologically really, really young. And they can get really desperate. You know, we've got questions here. Can sadness mask anger all the time? You know, we talked about this in episode 105. One of the ways that we defend against God is to turn against the self. And we turn against the self. That's a, dis that's a special form of displacement. When we turn our anger away from God and back onto ourself, it often makes us really sad and depressed can lead to a sense of hopelessness. How does myself show my parts love when all they feel is hate towards parts? Well, so I would say that that's another part, okay? If there's a part that's hating another part, that it, that's a part. That's not the self. The self doesn't have this really critical, condemning, a position towards parts and it can take a while for for the self to be revealed you know it can take a while to become in self people are far more blended far more of the time than they realize and sometimes our spiritual manager parts can try to imitate the self they can try to act like they are the self but the way that you can tell if a spiritual manager part is running your spiritual life is, is it more motivated by fear? Is there agendas driven by fear? 
rather than being motivated more by love? You know, is there a confidence in the goodness of God and God's benevolence and God's providence? Or are you really feeling more like a sinner in the hand of an angry God? So I am so grateful to be able to be here with you. I actually have little tears in my eyes about like, you know, kind of the some of the things that were shared today. Really grateful for you following the podcast, for doing this work, for being interested in your parts and being interested in your interior integration. I want you to be able to pray with me. We'll invoke our patroness and our patron, Our Lady, Our Mother, Untire of Knots, pray, pray, pray for, for us, St. John the Baptist. Pray, 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 pray for, for us. us. Thank you, Dr. Peter. God bless. Thanks, Dr. Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Peter. Thank you. Thank you.